Did I make a sound? <laughs> did, I, did, I, did, I not do, did we do the thing? Oh, we did. Uh -huh. okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Everything's fine. First try. Everything's good. We did it. Welcome. We did it. Yay. We did. We made All it right. to another Wolf Den podcast. The best and most professional podcast. Featuring featuring Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How are you? Uh, welcome, everyone. I don't have my, I don't know, of course, I don't have my alerts open. But thank you, Jeffrey Swordson, for the uh, Prime subscription. Love your warm-up music. Thanks. Uh, it went away for a minute. <laughs> we took a little too long. DM RX, thanks for uh, the subscription. Or gifted sub. And Soy Paco, thank you for the Prime. Guys, a lot to talk about today. Yes. Uh, big news in the gaming world this week, uh, specifically regarding the Microsoft Activision acquisition Kerfuffle. the deal that will never go away mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. and it looks like we're going to be dealing with it for a lot longer uh we have uh jedi survivor launched and if you're a pc gaming scrub it's not looking good for you <laughs> i'm gonna get it on pc well hopefully, ho by, then hopefully it's fixed. by then it's fixed yeah. yeah um more news on the rog ally uh nintendo making an appearance at a convention of uh, a new mortal Kombat game um, and a new movie to dethrone Super Mario Brothers as the king of video game movies. Got a trailer. It's not going to dethrone anything. There's a new video game movie? Yeah, it looks... Uh, Gr Gran Turismo. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I, 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 watched, about, I woke I, up and somebody said it to me and I watched it. I, yeah, that was I, the first thing I saw I want to talk about it because I have opinions on it. Okay. Um, but first... Oh, yeah. It's a new month. April so showers. Happy, happy May. Bring May... Video games that you get for free if you're subscribed <laughs> to PlayStation Plus or Xbox Live Gold. And, and, with a rare trifecta, Switch Online. Oh, wait, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. So, let us start off as we usually do with the Sony side of things. Yes. So, May. May. Happy May. Uh, starting today, because this is the first Tuesday I of have May. heard of zero of these games. I've, he I've heard of two of them. Um. So... For the, uh, starting today on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, you get Grid Legends, um, and you also get Chivalry 2, and on PlayStation 4 only, you get Descenders. Are any of these good? I, you know what? Descenders? Oh, I, I, need, I need a video of this, because so Descenders... Grid Sounds like it could be good. Grid Legends, it's like... Part oh, you guys look like... You guys like watching all my files? <laughs> there you go. Grid Legends, I know, is part of the, the Grid series. It's like um, like the hardcore racing series of games. So mm -hmm. if you're into like hardcore racing games, uh, that's a game I've heard of you. Grid. I've never heard of Grid Legends. Not, I mean, I guess it's like a spinoff of it where you play okay. as like Legends of the Sport. Cool, man. Is... is, is Kyle Mo Colin Mockery in it? Colin McRae? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, Chivalry 2 I have heard of, and I know this game has a big cult following. It's basically a first-person uh, medieval knight First game. person? Yeah. Is it a VR game? No. Okay, that's weird. Yeah. It's basically... Uh, I mean, well, Skyrim's like that, I guess. It's basically a battle royale game, but you, you're, you're, a, you're a knight of the round table. Oh, that kind of yeah. sounds cool for, yeah. uh, for a romp. Um... What is it? Pick your playstyle with four classes and twelve subclasses, each with their own unique weapons and abilities, uh, and much more than uh, much more than charge headfirst into a sun stunning sixty-four player cinematic battles. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. especially on console. And for a, for a freaking uh, uh, medieval battle royale. Yeah, I've heard I've heard the game is actually quite fun and uh worth a look <laughs> worth a look if it's free yeah especially Just if you have playstation plus and descenders is a downhill biking game i'm playing that on screen right now i actually think that kind of looks fun <laughs> yeah I, I like games like that yeah like trials and stuff yeah yeah uh okay w weird month weird month but uh, maybe month. some things to, to check out yeah. uh, it's free at least over on xbox for the first time and i don't know how long a game we recognize. Oh my god. Now this at first glance looks bad. Yes. But then you read it's gonna be pretty good. So for the entire month of May, you get Star Wars Episode One Racer. Has has this been on Xbox? Apparently. I did not know that. Yeah. Is it? I mean, it wasn't an 
Xbox game, right? No, it was an N64 game and also a Dreamcast game. I didn't, Dreamcast. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I know when they re-released this game uh, for Switch, it came out for other consoles, I yeah. think. So you're getting that. And I I hear it's a pretty decent port. Yeah, I've heard I've heard it's um I've heard it's a good port. I've heard the game holds up very well. It's a fast paced sci fi racing game. It's very similar to like games like F Zero and Wipeout. Um you know, it was fun back in the day. I'm it's, sure it's still fun. I yeah. played it recently and it's still very fun. Yeah. I think one of the uh it's one of the prettiest N sixty four games. Yes, for sure. Yes, takes good use of like the expansion pack too, really like boost the textures and everything. yeah it's one of the highest resolution i think yeah so so it really uh really works the n64 to, yeah. to, to the ground yeah and then the next game hoa from may 16th to june 15th they really did just call a game hoa yeah <laughs> um so yeah no video for this interesting interesting indeed. very pretty looking game but yeah, so definitely recommend playing uh, Episode 1 Racer. Uh, many people say the best thing to come out of the Phantom Menace era. The best thing to come out of the Phantom Menace era. That's kind of saying a lot. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't like that movie. but I, I don't. A lot of people like this game. Yeah, no, I so, like this game. Yeah. I like the, I, There's a lot of good stuff that came out of the Phantom Menace era. Yeah, well, games specifically. Games there specifically, were a lot of yeah. great games. Yeah, yeah, and like you know, I like the characters and stuff. Yeah. Like Darth Maul was sick. Yeah, but the movie, I didn't like. It. The movie, the movie's better than I think people give it credit for. I haven't watched it in a really long time. The the two problems with it, uh, uh is Anakin Skywalker, which is not Jake Lloyd's fault, and Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> yes. So you take them out, you have a pretty decent Star Wars movie on your hands. I haven't seen the new Mandalorian season. And that has, it's okay. It's not as good. It's better than the second season because mm -hmm. they don't stop every two minutes to re reintroduce characters that you recognize. But it's just weird in terms of like what they choose to focus on at any given okay. time. I mean, I got, I got, I got to watch it. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Switch. Yes. Tell me about it. I didn't know anything about Switch. Uh, Cadence of Hyrule: Crypt of the Necro Dancer. It's oh. free to play. Uh, That's a huge deal. From now until May 7th. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's not very long. No. Oh, no, no that is. That's the week. You, you got basically the week. But that goes by fast because I downloaded uh, Republic Commando to play during that free trial and I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. If you're going to do this, make sure you play it. Uh, and of course, as an added bonus, you could purchase Cadence of Hyrule, Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Uh, and related DLC for 50% off. And that sale ends on May 14th. Wait, wait, wait. Cadence of Hyrule Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is the this is the Zelda one. The Zelda okay. version. Right. Yeah. Right. So the game was available free uh free to play in its entirety now until May 7th for Switch Online uh subscribers. And not only that. The game and the DLC, if you want to buy it, is 50% off until May 14th. When, this was, I played this. It's great. Everybody yeah. was trying to tell me to play this game when I was talking about how much I loved the idea of the Hi-Fi Rush. Yeah. And I just think Hi-Fi Rush better was better but <laughs> but but i mean this is like you know a smaller team yeah you know this is a little more uh uh, uh humble i guess yeah so this one's good too right but but it's very similar in that the combat is based on uh the rhythm yeah of, 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 of the music but this one is straight up just kind of like a two a top-down zelda game yeah just you know, just you have to do everything to i think this like you know gets a lot of people into this type of game is the fact that it's Nintendo let an indie studio basically make their own Zelda game in their own style. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's kind of awesome. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jam and Jameson, thanks for the sixteen months. It's like imagine if they got the hot, the Hotline Miami guys to do a Mario game, <laughs> <laughs> or the guys that made the first person shooter Mario game. Yeah, <laughs> get them to just make that. No, what are they, Sega? <laughs> Uh, I found the original Crypt of the Necro Dancer to be really punishing. Wonder if Cadence of Hyrule is a little friendlier. I'd hope so because 
it's Nintendo like licensing it. Mm -hmm. So that Nintendo money, Nintendo would not allow them to put that game on their system if there wasn't a, a modicum of the Nintendo polish. Yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's it's got to be good. Yeah. So today we're gonna talk a lot about the Xbox Activision merger. Uh, what wh where we've gotten to so yeah. far, and how it might not happen anymore. Yeah, the, uh, last week there was a big roadblock that they hit. Yeah. Um, and it basically throws the whole thing into disarray. Um, so to recap, for those of you who don't know, uh, in January of last year, Microsoft announced it was in it intended on acquiring Activision Blizzard for sixty nine billion dollars. Nice. Which which was a, a, a record breaking, like m it was an insane amount of money yes. for a company to purchase another company in general. Yeah, and it was especially uh, for video games. for video yeah. games. It was a it's a huge, huge maybe deal. even like in tech period. I it's think. a huge deal yeah. as a company acquiring another company. It's for sheer numbers. It's a huge deal in any industry. Yeah. In tech, it is a huge deal. And then in gaming, it is an even huger yes. deal. Uh, so there's so much that could happen if this goes through. There's a lot of issues with, um, I guess, uh, 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 competition. Yes. Uh, but it also could help us a little bit yeah. if we are on the Microsoft side of things. <laughs> like with game, getting get Call yeah. of Duty on Game Pass would be fucking awesome. So... Like I said, this this deal was announced in January of last year. It's taken this long to get through because a, a deal this big doesn't just happen. It's right. got to get approved, not just in the country these companies are based in, um, which is America, but all America. around the world. And yeah, that and every <laughs> single country is, is going different. to have uh, uh, like like court cases about it. Yeah, and the the three big countries right now, um, one of them is technically a the european union so it's like a lot of countries the three big markets that are the roadblocks right now is america with the ftc uh the european commission um and the uk competition and markets authority the cma and as of last week the uk has blocked officially blocked Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Yeah, this is a huge blow and yeah. could could ruin the whole thing. It, yes. it, it, it could stall. I mean, it's going to stall it for sure. Yeah. But it could just completely leave it dead in the water. Uh, this is per The Verge. Microsoft's $69 billion deal to acquire Activision Blizzard has been blocked by the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA. After months of analyzing 3 million Microsoft and Activision documents and more than uh, 2,100 emails from the public, um, the CMA has concluded that the deal could alter the future of the fast-growing cloud gaming market, leading to reduced innovation and less choice for UK gamers over the years to come. Microsoft says it will appeal the decision, but it's a blow to Microsoft's hopes of acquiring Activis Activision Blizzard and will likely prevent the company closing its giant deal if the appeal is unsuccessful. Microsoft has a strong position in cloud gaming services and the evidence available to the CMA showed that Microsoft would find it commercially beneficial to make Activision's games exclusive to its own cloud gaming services, the CMA says. So that's a huge deal. Like, like yes. basically, I, I have issue with whenever there's a court case about technology, specifically gaming, because it always seems like the courts have no fucking idea yeah. what any of this means. But... This, I think, is pretty reasonable. Microsoft has a strong position in cloud gaming and acquiring Call of Duty, basically. Yeah. That, that's, they're always focusing on Call of Duty because that's the biggest uh, Activision property. Uh, would make competition a lot harder. Yeah. And I think that that's the view of the laws. They're trying to make sure that the competition isn't going to be stifled mm -hmm. from this. And uh, I th I think that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, I just lost my spot. The CMA estimates that Microsoft controls sixty to seventy percent of the cloud, the global cloud gaming services, and that adding control over Call of Duty, Overwatch, and World of Warcraft would give Microsoft a significant advantage in the cloud gaming market. Uh, I don't know if it's in this article, but apparently 
cloud gaming only accounts for two percent of the entire gaming market all right that is a little ridiculous yeah if we're focusing that hard on, on cloud 2%. gaming percent <laughs> we're focusing this hard on but yeah. all, like, that's, they, that's the thing like when this news was announced and the people found out that the cma's reason was because of cloud gaming everyone's immediate reaction was huh because like nobody was thinking of that because nobody really you know utilizes cloud gaming yeah in any aspect now yes microsoft is probably the biggest no not probably they are the biggest cloud gaming service out there but like the, there's not a lot of competition everyone else just gives up yeah like sony made a big deal about playstation plus they kind of just left it there on touch for a while nvidia has geforce now but like they barely do anything with it the, the, the biggest significance with playstation is that they use microsoft servers so like they're yeah. st they're the biggest competition for microsoft and they're still helping microsoft yeah. profit i take back what i said i don't think it's reasonable anymore because <laughs> only two percent of, yeah. of of gaming in general i will say though what the courts probably should have focused on mm -hmm. is that pc gaming in America, at least, this is in the in the UK. Yeah. But in America, at least, thirty five percent. I don't know. The survey shows thirty five percent of Americans are PC gamers. Somewhere around thirty to forty percent of gamers are PC gamers. Right. From what I've read in the past, uh, that's Microsoft. Yeah. That's a that you're gaming on <laughs> Microsoft. So people forget that. Like yeah. Microsoft might have issue where Xbox is the loser in the console wars right now, but. PC still counts. Yeah. They're profiting off of you playing yeah. your games on PC. Yeah. No matter how much Apple wants you to know that you can run Resident Evil Village on an M1 Mac, you're not going to play it on an M1 Mac. Yeah. You're going to play it on a Windows PC. Um, Microsoft has attempted to address concerns about around cloud gaming in the lead up to the decision. The software giant signed cloud gaming deals with Boostroid, Ubitus, and NVIDIA who to the, allow... Who the... Who exactly. Who the are these guys? Um to allow Xbox PC games to run on these rival cloud gaming services after striking a similar deal with Nintendo in December. These 10-year deals also include access to Call of Duty and other Activision Blizzard games if the deal is approved by regulators. The CMA says that it examined these deals, but they contain a number of significant shortcomings in the cloud gaming services. The CMA says the deals are too limited in scope, with models that meant gamers had to acquire the rights to play games by purchasing them on certain stores or subscribing to certain services. The deals didn't include agreements for Microsoft providing access to these games in rival multi-game subscription services or the ability for rivals to offer versions of the games on PC operating systems other than Windows. Last I checked, Call of Duty, what, like, not the modern ones, but, like, older Call of Duty games were available on Mac. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about like, that. Like, at least up to Black Ops 1. That makes sense. I just <coughs> know that Call of Duty is not available on cloud services mm -hmm. at all. Which was a very strange, uh, it was a very strange move by Activision. Yeah, I thought because when cloud gaming was you know coming up and I was trying it on all the different devices, that was the game I was most interested in trying with because everything else I could just play on Switch. Yeah. But Warzone, I had to play it on my Xbox. So playing like Game Pass and stuff and using the Nvidia and and all and even even Stadia at the time nothing would let me play warzone yeah i would have to do like a remote into my pc and i didn't want to do that then yeah i have to use like parsec or something or i don't even think you could use steam link because it would be it's the activision launcher oh yeah yeah so i have to use log into battle net yeah but you can't yeah and you can't remote battle net yeah so just a very strange move by activision to not have my uh, call of duty and on any cloud services yeah. at all uh, the CMA also noted that the deals would standardize the terms and conditions on which games are available instead of open competition in the cloud gaming market. We concluded that without the merger, Activision games would become available on cloud gaming services in the UK in the near future. The CMA initially sided with Microsoft over Call of Duty on PlayStation concerns last month, noting that it would be costly for Microsoft to withhold the popular franchise from PlayStation. This left some cloud gaming concerns on the table, but the regulators say it's cons but the regulators say it considered whether the benefit of having Activision's content on Game Pass outweighed the concerns around cloud gaming in the UK. 
Microsoft engaged constructively with us to address these issues, and we are grateful for that, but their proposals were not effective to remedy our concerns and would have replaced competition with ineffective regulation in a new and dynamic market, says Martin Coleman, the chair of the independent panel of experts conducting the investigation. We remain fully committed to the acquisition and will appeal, says Microsoft President Brad Smith in a statement to The Verge. The CMA's decision rejects the pragmatic path to address competition concerns and discourages technology innovation and investment in the United Kingdom. We have already signed contracts to make Activision Blizzard's popular games available on 150 million more devices, and we remain Whoa. committed to reinforcing these agreements through regulatory remedies. We're especially disappointed af that after lengthy, lengthy deliberations, the decision appears to reflect a flawed understanding of this market and the way that relevant cloud technology actually works. Activision Blizzard CEO and piece of shit Bobby Kodak uh, <laughs> says the company has already started work on an appeal in an email to employees on Wednesday. Alongside Microsoft, we can and will contest the decision, and we've already begun the work to appeal the UK Competition Appeals Tribunal. Uh, we're confident in our case because the facts are on our side. This deal is good for competition. In a media statement, Activision took how, a... How could the deal be good for competition? Like, I don't like, know. I, like, I don't... Like, in general, no. The, the deal is not good for competition. Yeah, that's, just, that's just an insane thing to Unless, say. Unless, like, Microsoft is basically going to leave Activision games alone, as in whatever games they would appear on normally, whatever yeah. systems they would appear on normally... They will continue to do so. Microsoft's not going to force all of these games. Like, God willing, the next Tony Hawk game will not be Xbox exclusive. Yeah. Like, unless they go that route, yeah, not really you know, great for competition. Yeah, I don't understand how you could just yeah. come out and say that. I mean, I mean, there's other things like, it's pot. I mean, it might say it later in this article, but it's possible that they let the deal go through, but just with it, with an addendum that says you cannot uh put you cannot do make exclusive cloud gaming so, yeah like like if you, like if you're gonna put call of duty on your cloud services you have to also allow it on other cloud services yeah uh i think that's that's what they're talking about because like yeah call of duty can go on game pass but is it gonna go on geforce now it would it go on if stadia was still around would it have gone on stadia they would have th that angers me because the whole <laughs> thing that the whole reason i like this it, like, like first of all one big company acquiring another big company is usually a bad thing. Yes. And in this case, probably still a bad thing. But you're looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. I get to play Call of Duty on Game Pass. That's yeah. fucking awesome. I have been wanting to do that for so long. And now the fucking, who is this? The UK. The, yeah, the, the Brits. The uh, CAT. Competition CMA. Appeal, whatever. The CMA comes out and goes, hey, you can do this deal. Oi, crikey. You, this no, deal. that's Australian. That's Sorry, Wood. Was Sorry, Wood. <laughs> you could do the deal, but the thing that Bob wants can't have yeah. that. Like, that's annoying. That's very annoying. Yeah. But hopefully this doesn't discourage Microsoft from releasing games like Call of Duty on the cloud. Yeah. Because it's possible the CMA comes out and says, hey, you can't put Call of Duty here. Unless you put it on other cloud services. And then Microsoft just goes, all right, we just won't put it on cloud services then. Yeah. And then that fucking sucks for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, in a media statement, Activision took a harsher tone towards the UK. The CMA's reports contradict the ambitions of the UK to become an attractive country to build technology business, to build technology businesses, said spokesperson Joe Crisson. Um, we will work aggressively with Microsoft to reserve, uh, to reverse this appeal. The report's conclusions are a dis disservice to UK citizens who face increasingly dire economic prospects. We will reassess our growth plans for the UK. Global innovators, large and small, will take note that despite all the its rhetoric, the UK is clearly closed for business. A Microsoft appeal will push back the company's plans to try and get this deal over the line by the end of July. Uh, Microsoft had originally planned to close the deal on July 18th, and it will now be forced to negotiate an extension to the merger agreement. If Microsoft CMA appeal fails or it fails to get approval from other regulatory from other regulators, it will owe Activision three billion dollars in Holy breakup crap. fees. Holy crap! <laughs> um, so far, regulators in Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Chile, uh, Serbia, Japan, and South Africa have approved the deal. The EU is set to make a decision by May 22nd. 
uh, with Reuters reporting last month that the deal is likely to be approved by the EU regulators following the NVIDIA and Nintendo licensing agreements. Microsoft also faces regulatory scrutiny from the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, in the United States. The FTC sued to block Microsoft's uh, purchase last year, and that investigation is still ongoing. The evidentiary hearing is scheduled for August 2nd, and there are signs the case could unearth rare details on the games industry exclusivity deals if documentation is made public. That's the best part of this whole thing is that we keep seeing really strange behind the scenes like very candid talks between the big three yes. uh, console manufacturers. Yeah. And spoiler alert with um, stuff from this uh, announcement uh, is part of that. Like we do learn some more things mm-hmm. about the gaming industry, but yeah, it's, it's nuts that of everything they focused on cloud gaming as the reason why they're canceling. They're striking down the deal. Yeah. It, it seems like they, so, so wait, we don't know if there's going to be an addendum yet, right? Did they just My, straight up shut it down? They, they said they declined the deal and Microsoft and Activision have the right to file an appeal. Mm-hmm. So they're going to file an appeal and hopefully get the CMA to change their mind. Oh, so there's not even an addendum. It's just you can't do it at all because of the cloud gaming. Right. They that's said, crazy. Yeah. So that's, that's, crazy. Why, that's why Microsoft and Activision now have to file an appeal. Apparently, though... I forgot where I read this, but 60% of the appeals that get filed fail. That makes sense. So that, that sounds high. Yeah. I mean, I mean, no, that sounds, it's, it's that sounds, it's considerably low, high honestly. compared to like here. I'd imagine appeals fail because they, they, I, I'd be, I'd imagine they, that they appeals resubmit are, the same thing again. Yeah. Without any changes. Yeah. I'd imagine the appeal fails more often than not because it already failed the first time. You yeah. know, like you're already losing. Well, it looks like Microsoft, Microsoft is going out of their fucking way to get this deal done. Yeah. So I'm, I would imagine they would bend over backwards. Like they'd never bent over backwards before yeah. to get this deal done. Like they would be like, all right, we'll put call of duty on PlayStation plus their stupid subscription service. We'll put it on <laughs> Nvidia. We'll put it on. We'll put it on ones that get made up by teenagers in their basement. Just let us buy the stupid company. Yeah. Would they have to reapply and, and maybe they have to make the addendum and say that we won't put it on cloud services. Yeah. Uh, which is insane. That's yeah. an insane thing for them to have to do. But also it's kind of an insane thing for a merger to happen for $70 yeah. billion dollars in the games industry. Um, yeah, we did find out a lot of weird behind the scenes stuff because of this deal. Yeah. And uh there's also this next part is something that I was very interested in. Uh is this about how they uh were forcing uh Nintendo? They were trying to force Nintendo to to uh speak on their dealings with Microsoft? Um was that the CMA or was that the That might be America. That might have been America. Yeah. Um, so maybe this, this is different. This is about how in that same report that the CMA filed uh, and their blocking of the deal, they they come to the conclusion, the CMA come to the conclusion that the Switch isn't powerful enough to run Call of Duty. Well, how, do they, how do they know? Uh, the report outlined several reasons for the block, including uh, how it would directly impact the fast-growing glo- cloud gaming market. Um, though one further reason that has been brought to our attention... Uh, this is per Nintendo uh, Nintendo Life is directly related to the Switch. One proposal that came out came about as part of the acquisition was Microsoft's ten year commitment to bring Call of Duty games to the Switch, which the CMA believes is not technically capable of running the game in a manner resembling the experience on more powerful platforms. Nintendo does not currently offer Call of Duty, and we have seen no evidence to suggest that its consoles would be technically capable of running a version of Call of Duty that is similar to those in Xbox and PlayStation in terms of quality of gameplay and content. Okay, well, you know what? They're not wrong. (laughs) But they're making it sound like that's Nintendo's fault, not Activision's. Well, why bring it up at all? Because I understand why bringing it up, because Sony made such a big stink about if Microsoft buys Activision, then they're going to release an inferior version of Call of Duty on Sony platforms. Yeah. And Microsoft is saying like, no, we wouldn't do that. They would not make good uh, financial business sense for us. So the CMA then by conjuncture is now looking at the Switch going, this thing can barely run anything. 
this thing can barely run Sonic Frontiers, <laughs> and you're thinking about bringing Call of Duty over here? You're crazy. So they they want Call of Duty to be the same across all platforms, including a lower text platform like the Switch. Right. And if they're looking at the Switch thinking this can't run Call of Duty, then there's no way we're going to approve this deal. Which is ridiculous because the Switch has proven capable of running complex games like Doom Eternal and uh, Wolfenstein and Skyrim and games like that. So it can run Call of Duty if you put the right people in charge to port it. Yeah, it, it's going to be worse than playing it on Xbox yeah, or PlayStation. Obviously, you wouldn't want to play it on... If you had the choice. Yeah. But a lot of people don't have the choice. And a lot of people would be willing to sacrifice the the the, the graphical fidelity for the portability. Yes. Like me. Yes. I would love the option to play Warzone portably. Yeah. Instead of having to stream it, which you can't even do. Yeah. Like, like, I want to stream Call of Duty because that's the only way I'll be able to play it portably. Yeah. If I can have it on the Switch, I won't even need to stream it. I mm-hmm. could just do that. I could just play it portably. Although, I will say, Apex is fucking horrible on Switch. <laughs> it's horrible. I I tried playing it a bunch of times, and I never want to do that. I will yeah. opt to not play it at all. Right. So, Microsoft... Well, I mean, the CMA is bringing this up because PlayStation. Well, I'm sorry. The CMA is bringing this up because Microsoft is 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 saying they're willing to work with Nintendo, mm-hmm. and PlayStation is saying, yeah, but it sucks. It's gonna suck on there. And the CMA is like, yeah, I get, yeah, it's gonna suck on yeah. there. So they're kind of siding with PlayStation in in, in this yeah. way. Yeah, Nintendo is just like, just just fucking leave us alone. <laughs> but I want to know. We, so I think the American courts are uh, 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 trying to get Nintendo to uh, uh, talk about the deal that they have with Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo appealed. They said they don't want to talk about it, but they're probably going to be forced to yeah. to give a deposition or something. And then we're going to learn so many juicy details oh, about wait. what yeah. that's going to be. It could be potential for a streaming situation. Yeah. And, and that would give us a lot more information. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Ray Zeflin says the controller dead zones on Switch are so bad for FPS games on Switch. Yeah. Yeah. Having gyro controls helps. helps. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the the the, the Joy Con are just not great. Yeah. And and I've tried. I even tried it with the freaking uh, Pro controller, and it was really really bad. Yeah. Even playing docked, it it sucked. <sighs> Um, there's something I wanted to say about this. Is this I, the article I wanted to pull, or so it's possible that um, because the deal was struck down in the UK, mm-hmm. that when this goes up against the FTC later this year, it's scheduled for August second. It's possible the American courts look to that, yeah, and 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 say, look. UK, you know, didn't approve this, so maybe we should look into what they thought was the issue. Yeah, and it's possible the American courts do the same thing. Except, American courts, I think, like to side with big companies more. They ha- than, they, do, than UK they traditionally do, but I know there have been a lot more like talk about you know breaking up monopolies and antitrust uh, regulation things like that. I mean. Look at what all the Swifties did with the Ticketmaster situation. They like they brought that to thank Cap- God for them. They, seriously, they brought that to the attention of Capitol Hill for Christ's sake. Literally, sake. we can't pass any laws. Yeah, nobody likes Ticketmaster. Yeah, on any <laughs> side. Not a single politician was yeah. like Ticketmaster is doing a great thing. Yeah, I, what was it like? The deal was basically like when they bought when Ticketmaster and Live Nation merged. Like the the basically it was down to like, are you going to raise prices? And they said no. And then guess what they and did? And then the they day? raised yeah. the prices, yeah. So, uh, this is not the article I thought I posted. Um, what ba- is this next one? So, this is an older article about how everyone thought the UK was going to approve the deal because Microsoft um, had made such a good, has made such strides in making sure the Call of Duty would be a multi platform game. Oh. So that's when everyone's like, oh, then the CMA is going to approve the deal because that was the big deal. And then they basically said, actually, cloud gaming is the big deal. Um, but so, Yeah, nobody expected the CMA to focus so heavily on cloud gaming. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but what this article does also bring up is that Microsoft's uh, overall revenue, uh, gaming revenue, is down four percent to three point six billion dollars um, from last year. And well, that, that's uh, a lot of billions of dollars. Xbox co- uh, content and service revenue is up three percent thanks to Game Pass. Hardware hardware revenue though is down thirty percent. Thanks to a prior year comparable elevated by increased console supply after pandemic shortages. So console sales are down. And the overall of uh, the overall Xbox division is down four percent. So th- like things are it's a downtime for yeah. the Xbox. It's not it's not a good time to be Xbox right now. I mean, I saw um I saw people talking about how a lot of games companies are losing revenue year over year like yeah. like they're not doing as good as they did last year and the year before that um but covid so yeah. like everything was so everything was selling so well during covid yeah. and we're going to return to a little bit more of a normalcy yeah so losing what how many percent it was such a low number four percent four percent overall yeah i don't think that's a huge deal but console sales are down 30 percent yeah that's two things one we're a little far into the life cycle now and two, no fucking Xbox games. It's they true. got no games. That's, that's <laughs> true. I mean, Redfall just came. I don't have anything about this, but Redfall just came came out. It's not reviewing well. Yeah. Um, that's not a good look. No. You know, you finally get some like first party content, and it's it's reviewing poorly. You, that it's, game it's never party, looked good. It's first party content from a studio you acquired, and you made a big deal about its acquisition. Yeah, and they you always have great these, games. You acquire all these studios, and they're like none of them are putting out good games. Yeah, that's that's not. It's really a bad look. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I mean, I know what it is. They're just not focusing on yeah. that. They're not. I don't know what the deal is. I'm willing to bet that they are comfortable with the amount of money that they're making yeah. and the uh, trajectory that they're taking. I'm willing to bet that losing th- what was it, thirty percent of hardware revenue? Yeah. I'm willing to bet that they don't really care, and I'm sure Game Pass is is pumping the numbers a little bit in other ways. A little bit, but at the same time, like, you know, you you want you made a product, you want people to buy the product. You yeah, know, and if thirty if sales are down thirty percent, like that's not good for your product. You got to get people to buy your product. I think they're I think they're moving towards just getting people to play the games on services. But then at the same time, like the Xbox is the great the Xbox system. Mm-hmm. is the entry level device to get people to the service you know cuz chances are you don't you know maybe you don't have a gaming pc or maybe you don't have a device that could stream these games the xbox is guaranteed to do that you should just buy an xbox plug it up to your tv and it'll stream the, the stream the games you want yeah that's why they were making the streaming box yeah. that would have been the entry level Right, that would have been like what did they say? One hundred thirty. They were trying to target or something. Yeah, and then they couldn't. Yeah, uh, I don't. They canned it, but I think that there's still room for something oh, like they're, that. They're totally still working on something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got I gotta give credit to Stadia. That was the perfect idea. <laughs> yeah, to have just the stream running in a Chrome browser. If you could just open a Chrome browser. And just play an Xbox game. Yeah. That's fucking unbelievable. Mm-hmm. But uh, they're not marketing it like that. I think you can do that, but you have to use Edge or something. Like, there's, you can just yeah, play it's... Game Pass in a browser, but it's not great. It's amazing how, like, you know, no one's gotten the concept that, like, if people want to stream games from the cloud, you know, you either go to the website in any browser. It should just work in any browser. Or you develop an app for your smartphone or your tablet or your smart TV. Like nobody's nobody's like figured that out yet. Microsoft kind of has it figured out because you can get uh, a Game Pass app for Samsung TVs, but not all of them, only modern ones. You know, there's still no app on iOS and Android. It's because Apple and Google have stupid rules. Playing on but, a, I mean, smart TVs have, they're terrible they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're the os's are always bad yeah some of the newer ones are getting a lot better yeah but uh they're gonna have i could imagine having a low latency gaming running off of a smart tv is probably very hard to, yeah. to accomplish but it's at the same time 
a lot of people might not even care about that. They just want to play Halo. They don't yeah. necessarily care about low latency. They just want to play the game. Well, it has to be low latency enough so that you don't notice right. it. Right. Xbox Cloud Gaming Beta. It's still beta. Can yeah. I, here, I'm going to click on Hi-Fi Rush. Controller, not connected. Okay, so I can. Yeah. Oh, continue anyway. I'm loading it up. Oh, there you there go. There it is. I'm loading up Hi-Fi Rush right now. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. But you need to hook up an Xbox controller. Yeah. Some things shouldn't require an Xbox controller. Right. You know, like I should be able to play Halo Infinite with, with a mouse, mouse and keyboard. keyboard. Yeah. I'm going to play Hi-Fi Rush on my freaking MacBook. That's kind of <laughs> fucking awesome. Get me out of here. I don't want to actually do this. Quick game. Oh, I can't quit the game because I don't have an Xbox controller. <laughs> Quick. Oh, there we go. You're trapped. Now, Halo Infinite. Yeah, controller yeah. required. That's weird for Microsoft. I mean, yeah. it's still beta. Get it out of beta. Get it out of beta well, and market it like Can't this. the Steam version of Master Chief Collection play with a mouse and keyboard? Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that means that's running the Xbox I'm, version of I'm it. I'm pretty sure on Xbox you can plug in a mouse and keyboard. Mm. <sighs> Mac OS is how I started on No Man's Sky. Oh my god. Wow. That be that this will be mainstream when they market that. When they market that you could just fucking plug in a controller and just play in your browser. I think because then you can go in school on your little Dell Opt Optiplex and plug in a controller. I think it'll get mainstream once they they could convince Apple, you know how it actually works. And, oh, true. Yeah, and like they allow it, and because if it if it's an app on your phone, I think more people will like understand it mm -hmm. and like you know be able to use it because that's what everything's going now. Everything's app based. Yeah, you know? I mean, right now they sell. PlayStation 5 controllers in yeah. the Apple Store yeah. for uh, Apple TV. Apple TV. Uh, so they have to convince Apple to put friggin' Game Pass on yeah. Apple TV and, and on iPhone and stuff. Because mm -hmm. right now you can't, they just won't let you play yeah. it on, on iPhone. Also, like, I mean, Microsoft is the biggest competition for Apple in terms of computing. Yeah. So it, would, it makes sense why they put PlayStation controllers in the Apple Store and not xbox controllers well i mean the apple tv and like uh ipads and iphones support uh, xbox controllers you could yeah, you they support everything now. you used to be able to buy xbox controllers from the apple store I but know. i guess they like swapped them out for when the dual sense came out xbox controllers are the best universal controllers yes. they work for everything yes playstation 5 controllers are pretty good too yeah. but uh xbox is just yeah those are better they're there everybody supports xbox yeah. controllers anyway where are we? Uh, now we are on to what I think is the most interesting part about um, the CMA's report okay. uh, about the blocking. Uh, because it talks about the budget of AAA video games. Okay. And how it's gotten absolutely out of control. Yeah. The recent decision by the UK's uh, Competition and Markets Authority to block Microsoft's merger uh, was accompanied by a 418-page uh, report outlining its research and reasoning including a section devoted to ever-rising game development costs. Um, the site, uh, it cites research by a market analyst firm, IDG, projecting blockbuster game budgets would grow from an average of 50 to $150 million last console generation to over $200 million for games released in the next couple of years. Back in 2014, it was closer to $60 million. Uh, the CMA, referencing the report, writes... Also, the report says that uh, some AAA franchises like Call of Duty have developed budgets already exceeding $300 million, and the next GTA and other future temples are also expected to hit the $250 million mark or higher. Activision is also quoted in its report saying, with reference to Call of Duty, uh, we, have to, we have to make so much content for Call of Duty that we can't even lean on one studio anymore. Now we need uh, now we need almost 1.5 lead studios for each annual Call of Duty. That kind of bandwidth pressure is forcing us to use outsource to use outsourcers more and more. I don't see that changing anytime soon. The regulators are then cite testimony from other publishers about their own hit franchises that reinforces this trend. While while some range some of the ranges differ, uh, they're all going up. One publisher said that it spent $164 million on pre-launch development costs and $55 million on marketing. 
Another publisher says budgets range from $80 million to $350 million with marketing costs of up to $310 million for the biggest games. A third publisher reports costs between $110 million and $350 million for recent releases. A fourth publisher said budgets range from $90 million to $180 million with marketing ranging from $50 to $150 million. Uh, its most expensive game cost $660 million to develop with a marketing budget of $550 million. That is... That is... Uh... That's a take two. That, that's, that, a, that, that's Grand Theft Auto. That's got to be. Yeah. yeah but that, that, that's a billion dollars total to make a video game. The, I'm most surprised. I mean, I, I know that AAA games cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. But I'm most surprised at the marketing budgets. That's insane. Uh, so in movies, and when it comes to like uh, big budget movies, like because th- those cost around that much too. And the marketing for those movies is more or less exactly the same so like i know a marvel movie costs 200 million dollars to make the marketing budget for that is going to be around 200 million dollars that's crazy that's why when you when you look at whether or not a movie is a success or not you always say you double uh they it has to make four times its production budget to be a success because then that includes a profit on production and marketing yeah yeah so that's why every movie has to make a billion dollars the box office now I think one of the biggest problems with uh, the cost of games right now is that these companies are expecting every game to be a runaway success. Yeah. And that's why you see a lot of games in the in recent years that were shoehorning in multiplayer because they were yeah. trying to be the next Fortnite and, and, yeah. and whatever. And now like we see games like you know suicide squad that are trying to shoehorn in life service elements yeah you know to try and ride that trend I- i'm hoping that it's failing for them like i'm hoping that um because obviously they, they, they these are smart businessmen I'm, yeah I, it seems like they're throwing all of this money at stuff because it pays off sometimes like if you spend a hundred million dollars on 10 games and one of the games makes uh, i have to do math you spend $100 million on 10 games. One of those games makes a billion and one dollars. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, you've made, you've done it. You've, yeah. You've become a success, you know? So I'm hoping that they spend $100 million on 10 games and all of them fail because yeah. they're trying to, <laughs> too hard to make one of them a runaway success instead of making all of them good in their own right. Yeah. Uh, the article continues, the CMA points to this as evidence that it's unlikely another company could reasonably make a replacement for Call of Duty any time soon, but it also shows just how unsustainable big budget game development has gotten. With blockbusters like Suicide Squad and Starfield costing tons and taking uh, forever to come out, the pressure and risks associated with them succeeding or failing are greater than ever. It's a recipe for disaster and also as publishers continuing to retreat into their most trusted franchises. Ubisoft has been upfront about doubling down on Assassin's Creed and Far Cry while uh, while nearly halfway through the console uh sorry and while nearly halfway through the current console generation PlayStation fans are still waiting for Sony to take a swing on a new IP. Sean Layden, a uh, former chairman of Sony Interactive Entertainment, uh, predicted back in 2020 that the PlayStation 5 era would push this math to its breaking point. I don't think in the next generation you could take those numbers and multiply them by two and expect the industry to continue to grow, he said at the time. Some of the biggest game companies appear to uh, determine to try and do just that. The Konami man in the chat says, yes, we need more games to be mid-level games. PS2 had a bunch of awesome yes. games in that category. Yeah, and then, you know, much like in the real world, there's no more middle class, so... Y- yes, <laughs> there's. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a smaller budget. Smaller meaning like... 50 million yeah. instead of 100 million and expecting less of a return or yeah. or, or th- there's also the possibility you spend a very small amount and get a huge return yeah if the idea is unique enough and none of these big publishers are trying stuff like that yeah they're just copying and pasting other successes that they've had yeah. without realizing that the reason they were successes in the past was because there was nothing else like them. Yeah. There's been how many fucking Assassin's Creed games? Like it was cool <laughs> on the second one. Yeah. And then they made 
the second one part two and the second, second one, one part, part three. three and then it's like all right dude we've had yeah, enough exactly um and now and now we're stuck in an endless cycle where like that's the only game and far cry that makes ubisoft money so other ubisoft franchises that people like like uh rayman like beyond good and evil like uh splinter cell those games don't come out as often if at all because yeah. they're not like assassin's creed they're not like far cry but resident evil's doing a gr- capcom is kind of doing great things because like you got resident evil i mean they've been re-releasing I, I, their I old have some shit. things to say about that yeah but when they do it mainline resident evil games they're changing shit up. Yeah. And they've always been since the beginning of Resident Evil. The mainline shit has always... They, they might have like two or three that are like pretty much the same. Yeah, and no, then they it's... completely change shit. Yeah. And that's why the franchise is... is That's why there's so yeah. long between development. And that's why the franchise is successful. It's people the, like in it. case Resident Evil sucks again, break glass emergency. Yeah. You know, yeah. when Resident Evil starts to go down a bad path, they stop and they reevaluate the, what the series is supposed to be. And they start again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now they're stuck in a rut where... You know, they're they're just remaking the old games. Yeah. You know, to the point where like like I like the Resident Evil 4 remake, but I have no desire to play it as much as I want to because I played this game twice already yeah. in the past like three years. Resident Evil 2 remake came out in 2019. Resident Evil 3 remake came out in 2020. Three years later was the Resident Evil 4 remake. That's like the three of the, the exact same games in a very small amount of time. That's the Call of Duty problem. That's the Ubisoft problem. Yeah. You know, it it you know it ruins the specialness of what these of what uh, the Resident Evil Two remake was at the time. So by that lot, like if they keep going down that path, then they run the risk of doing what you know these other companies are doing, where they're just sticking back into their comfort zone, and we're not going to get you know not a, like. I don't want Mega Man 12. I want like a, I want a, Mega Man 12. I want a modern <laughs> version of Mega Man. Yes. What would what would Mega Man in 2023 well, be? I think they've done terrible shit with Mega Man. Yeah. But but I'm saying that Capcom is the lesser of all of the evils. Right. Because look at Street Fighter. Yeah. Street Fighter, every Street Fighter is wildly different, except for the the two, 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 right. two again. Well, yeah. <laughs> but um Every numbered Street Fighter. Yeah, they they're they're not just copying and pasting the games. They do sometimes, <laughs> but, but you look at Activision with Call of Duty. It's literally been a yeah, copy, and, copy paste and paste since Modern yeah. Warfare. You look at uh, I, you know what? Even Square Enix with Final Fantasy, they've been doing some different yeah, shit with that trying, too. Yeah. Every time, um, but every big publisher has franchises that they copy and paste. Ubisoft is the worst offender, where every single game is a copy and paste of every other game that they have. Yeah, not even like. You know, within one franchise, all, all of their of franchises. Them. You know what? Hannah asked me the other day because X Defiant, that's Ubisoft's uh like Call of Duty type thing. Yeah. And X Defiant has all of the Tom Clancy. It's Tom Clancy's X Defiant. And has oh, all of the Tom one, yeah. Franchi Tom, Tom Franchi. <laughs> Tom Franchi franchise. It's got all Tom Clancy like I thought it was characters, but it might just be items from other games and stuff. Right. It, it tries to bring the Tom Clancy universe stuff all together. And Hannah goes, what are Tom Clancy games? Ooh. And I had to explain. This oh. is very difficult to explain. Yeah. I had to say Tom Clancy was an author that had books and then Ubisoft got the rights to make games based on the books. But then they started making games that weren't based off of books and just said they were Tom Clancy games. So Tom Clancy is just Ubisoft's like tactical games. Yeah. But they also have tactical games that aren't Tom Clancy games. But for the most part, it's their tactical games. And she goes, he he didn't make these games. And I'm like, no, he's dead now. Well, yeah. (laughs) And, And they're like, so what is an example of another franchise that is like that and i was like there is none (laughs) there's no other franchise where they just put the name in front of it yeah for no reason just there's no reason that it's a tom clancy game other than it's vaguely tactical sometimes um tom clancy did work on like the original rainbow six and i think the original ghost recon and then ubisoft those were books yeah yeah, and then Ubisoft bought Red Storm Entertainment, which was Tom Clancy's video game studio. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, it, it like it makes sense to us because we played the games since yeah. they were actually Tom Clancy games. 
But the franchise does not make any sense. No, not anymore. anymore yeah. No, because then you have games like The Division, not a Tom Clancy game. Yeah. Also, like it takes place. It it doesn't take place in the world of all the other Tom Clancy games. Yeah. Tom Clancy, the books, you told me, Ding Chavez is a character in all of them. Yeah. He's just like a throwaway character yeah. in a lot of them. But he's he, the, the, you, there's a universe. There's yeah. a Tom Clancy yeah, the, universe. Because the main character in the Tom Clancy books is Jack Ryan, who has that TV show on Amazon starring Jim from The Office. Yes. Yeah, that's like a well-known like franchise in the tactical military genre. But The Division... Doesn't take place in our world yeah. because, you know, there's like an apocalypse that yeah. happened. So it's not a shared universe yeah. because of that, you know, like it doesn't, it, it doesn't no, make I, any yeah. sense. Anyway. Uh, Eric says, yeah, Tony Hawk doesn't have anything to do with the bird. Okay. So Tony <laughs> Hawk, that franchise yeah. then. Well, no, but I mean, I don't, I don't know. I didn't really follow it closely after Underground 1, but I know, like, he played all the games and he play tested all of them and he did motion capture for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, he's more he involved. involved. He's more involved than, like, a lot of people are. Tom Clancy is dead. Yeah. <laughs> Any new franchise that say Tom Clancy's is wrong yeah. because he is dead. <laughs> people are saying John Madden. No. That's a little different. I Th mean, that's a, a football game. This is your yearly football game. Yeah. Like, like Tom Clancy games are always so, weird and different. John, uh, yes. Like EA went to John Madden and said, hey, we want to make a football game. We want you to be the face of it. And John Madden said, you are not allowed to put my face on this game unless you have the right number of players on each side. And EA at the time said, we don't have the technology to do that. And John Madden's like, then we will wait for the technology <laughs> to do it. And that's when we'll do it. So... But John Madden, like, was at least, even at the end of his life, tangentially involved with the games until, and then, like, he died and he, like, he allowed them to continue to use his name afterwards. Because at that point, Madden became synonymous with football games, you know? Yes. I'm, yes, I see Fred Nard said Sid Meier. Sid Meier makes sense, but it's only Civilization, right? No, Sid Meier has made other games. There's other games that carry Sid Meier's names, but that's because Sid Meier actually works on those games mm -hmm. like sid meyer's pirates he worked on that game yeah yeah so yeah i can't think of another even like a movie franchise that has like a name in the front and the guy has nothing to do with yeah. it yeah it's just the name of the franchise to, i was actually watching this is kind of related i was watching um youtuber todd in the shadows he likes to do um breakdowns of like a band or artists um the album that basically killed their career and he recently did run DMC's last album, Crown Royal. DMC is not on the album. So the second half of Run DMC is not on the album, but his face is on the cover. What the and hell? It's, it's it's an official Run DMC album. Yeah. There you go. That's there you it. Go. That's an example. Right <laughs> that's <there>. an example. <laughs> I was thinking like Wizarding World, but like that's a universe. That is yeah, I don't know. That's I don't want to get into the Harry Potter talk again, but like that's like a really like weird extreme case where like they are just desperately trying to keep that yeah. franchise running without the main character that everybody likes. Stan Lee is kind of a good example. Yeah. Because Stan Lee, he would have his name on stuff that he really didn't have much to do with, especially yeah. towards the end of his life. Yeah. And uh yeah, I, I I think that's kind of a good example, but but there's not much like yeah. like like it's it's like yeah that like reality show and stuff. Yeah, and but also too like for years Marvel Comics, even if like if Stanley wasn't writing the book, it would always say Stanley presents. True, and this is even after he like he was the editor in chief. Okay, that might be a good example. Yeah. Then. Anyway. What, were we what the about? fuck were we even doing here? <laughs> Video games cost a lot to make. That's oh, because were... these idiot, stupid developers are are just th no publishers are dumping money on stuff on the wrong things on the yeah. wrong things, and they fall flat on their face like freaking uh, a Redfall. Yeah. <laughs> Again, bring it back to that one quote. I want smaller games uh, that cost less to make with worse graphics. Yeah, so whatever, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. You've all seen that quote. It, it said they said we learned that the marketing budgets are insane for these games. Yeah, 
Hi-Fi Rush just farted it out. Yeah. That's why they just farted that game out. Yeah. You know? But, you know, that might have backfired because that game apparently, uh, allegedly didn't sell very well. And, right. Like, didn't hit the metrics that Microsoft wanted. So, you see that. I'm skeptical of that still. Right. I think that but, it might have still met the metrics that they but wanted. But say it's true. Yeah. You see that, and that's going to prevent... You know, other publishers from wanting to do shit like that. Yeah, no, they're, right. they're going to take the wrong lessons from it. Yeah. You know, everybody who played Hi-Fi Rush liked Hi-Fi Rush because it was a new, innovative take and an actual fun game to play without all the bullshit that's, you know, corrupting modern gaming. But they're not going to see that. Yeah. They're just going to see, oh, nobody bought this because everybody wants these type of games that we've been making and running into the ground these past few years. It's so easy to have a formula like these AAA studios have yeah. and, and be like, if we take Call of Duty and we make another Call of Duty, we will do good. Yeah. And, you know, it works for some yeah. games like Call of Duty. Um, and unfortunately for a game like Call of Duty, you're going to have to spend a couple hundred million dollars on the marketing because yeah. that's just how it works. But if you take a game and it stands great on its own two feet and it has its own merits and people see it and they like it. If you see the game and you like it, mm -hmm. you don't need to spend that much on marketing. Yeah. You can spend less on the game, spend less on the marketing if the game's good. Yeah. And people will see that the game is good. Unfortunately though, these big AAA companies have a have a formula. Yeah. And that formula requires them to spend hundreds of million dollars on some dumb bullshit sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, do, is there, do we have any notification? Timmy Two Shoes, thanks for the 11 months. Did <laughs> did get banned after resubbing? Okay, yeah, you're banned. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Socrates? Socrate? Thanks for the 100 bits. Shout out to Starlink. I'll pour one out for you. That game, I can't believe the amount of people that said that that game was good. I was playing it. I remember you saying- like, Losing you hate, my mind about game, how yeah. god-awful that game was. I can, and that was- it was a Ubisoft game yeah. that felt like every other Ubisoft game, but you were flying in a ship. <laughs> I don't understand how it could feel like every other Ubisoft that's, game. That's a it's honestly, such a different concept. That's a that's a that's a technical achievement right there. If yeah, they could pull that off. There's literally there were literally map towers. Wow, it was insane. They, they, that you're literally just playing a fucking Ubisoft game just in a ship. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Ray Zeflin, uh, I think. We did not say this. Thank you for the 53 months. Uh, all right. This one is an article I put here. Uh, the Miu Mini Flip. Remember, you know yes. that little tiny guy that I like? Yes. Little guy? Yes. There's, they're, There's they're, an SP they're version. They're making another one. People really like the clamshells. Yeah. So there was a patent that leaked for the, the Miu Mini Flip. Mm -hmm. uh, this is by Retro Dodo. For those in the handheld community excited about clamshell designs, it, it would seem that Miu is considering a Mini Flip. Recent design images have leaked on Discord, leaving us to believe that Miu intends to add a new product to their lineup, knowing their history and ability to deliver quantity or, or in a timely manner. I wouldn't get your hopes up just yet. But as per usual, it is exciting to imagine the possibilities. So let's take a stroll down fantasy lane and consider the Miu Mini Flip. Images provide, uh, discovered by Lei on Retro Handheld's Discord. That guy always seems to be ahead in the handheld game. There it is. There's the pretty little design. These little thumb, these little thumb, uh, thumb sticks. That, that looks like yeah. impossible to use yeah the uh, those are just there because they're like we have to put these on there and someone's like yeah. no we don't have to put them on there no we have to put them on there the, that's what that argument was the horizontal shoulder buttons look fine the, the yeah to r2 situation uh but the thumbsticks i mean look a, a lot this device i'm willing to bet will only be able to play up to playstation one yeah and they always put thumbsticks even if it's playstation one you know well, I mean, the PlayStation One had thumbsticks, but most of those games didn't use them. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, there's barely any games that required thumbsticks yeah. on on PlayStation One, and all of those games run fine without thumbsticks. Yeah. Um, Ape Escape is the only one that I know <laughs> that you need the thumbstick. Yeah. Um, so this is really there for Ape Escape. <laughs> uh. So I guess it's cool that it's there at all, like that, that you'll be able to use it. But yeah. like, it's really just 
there if you need it, not not something to use too much. I'm willing to bet once this thing comes out, people will have uh, grips for it already, yeah. and you'll be able to yeah. play it with that. Anyway, the new Miu Mini Flip uh, is compact clamshell handheld. The name Miu 355 was also mentioned, which suggests a 3.5-inch display, which is exactly what we would have guessed. I think every like port retro handheld has a 3.5-inch display. They all use the same exact IPS right. display, I think. That's our favorite screen for retro games, and it is the screen used in the most recent MiU, the MiU Mini Plus, which I'm pretty sure you still can't get. Unfortunately, we only have low-resolution images available, but still quite revealing about the intentions with this new clamshell design. The design features a D-pad, four action buttons, four triggers, and surprisingly, two analog sticks. The inclusion of these joysticks suggests that the game play power inside the MiU Mini Flip should exceed that of the previous Mini and Mini Plus. I'm going to go ahead and say probably not. <laughs> the me the the Mini and Mini Plus both were capable of PlayStation, but the button configuration meant that you'd only want to attempt 8 to 32-bit era games. The addition of two analog sticks in in a MiU device means you'd start getting into 64-bit games such as N64, Dreamcast and PSP. I'm going to say that would be sick, yeah. but I doubt it. Just because they they these companies have had such such success releasing the same hardware with a very minor difference, yeah. and this minor difference is going to be clamshell thumbsticks. Yeah. Something to notice about these particular thumbsticks is is that they appear to be somewhat normal in size. They are recessed into the shell enough to allow them to fit in a clamshell design. I'm gonna say they look kind of like a like a DS thumbstick. Yeah. Like a, like a like a 3ds look. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where where I leave off? This should be more enjoyable to use than sliders used on the Retroid Pocket Flip. I still haven't gotten my Pocket Flip. I'm still waiting for that. I'm a little pissed off because everybody else has theirs. The design of the Miu Mini Flip is obviously inspired heavily by the Game Boy Advance SP, much like the Fun Key S and Pal Kitty V90. Two wonderful emulators. And with only one screen, this inspiration makes more sense than referencing the Nintendo 2DS or 3DS line. I felt the like the new Retroid Pocket Flip has a lot of wasted space for this reason, and I think those who purchased one agree. One keen user on the Retro Hand of Discord, user Pal Kitty Fanboy 3 pointed this out. It has two USB ports and a mini HDMI in the render, so if that's accurate, it's not using the same chipset as the mini. Oh, that's that might debunk everything that I just yeah. said. Uh, anyway, that's some pretty smart detective work. So all signs pointing to much more powerful console and a lot more options like the HDMI out. Yeah, me use don't have HDMI out. I absolutely approve of that. One thing that I feel confident about is the colors used in the design draft do not reflect the color. Yeah, no, it, it looks like very obviously like a like a prototyping thing. So if the chipset's different, that would maybe tell that this thing might be a little more powerful, which is good. Mm -hmm. That then maybe MiU will, there'll be a reason to get a new MiU device. Uh, I have, oh, 3.5 inch screen. Yeah, this thing will probably, it'll be about like that, like about that big. Uh, I think later in this year or maybe even next year, we might start seeing uh, dual screen stuff. There you go. And that'll get real wacky in a yeah. while when we start seeing DS and 3DS, like emulators specifically made for yeah. DS and 3DS. I wonder if they'll have to do it a certain way. I wonder if Nintendo has like some sort of weird patent on that design because that is a very unique design. Yeah. So. No. Uh, well, that's that's the wonderful thing about portable emulation is that all of these are Chinese and, and they don't care. They do not care about yep. patents or anything. I <clears throat> talked about this on stream the other day. Uh, in Japan, they call these types of devices. Mm -hmm uh chinese uh consoles or chinese handhelds or something like that yeah uh, they specifically call them chinese uh where here we call them like, like emulators or, yeah. or or retro handheld i don't like the term retro handhelds everybody always tries to correct me when i say portable emulator and say that it's a retro handheld but retro handheld to me implies game boy yeah that's what i was like, gonna that's say. a yeah. retro handheld yeah Whereas the Switch is a current handheld. Yeah. 3DS is kind of a current handheld. Yeah. Retro handheld just doesn't sound right. But portable emulator sounds right. Yeah. 
or handheld emulator. Anyway, that's the Miu uh, uh, mini flip that we might end up getting. Next, uh, I just want to say real quick, breaking news. Marvel Midnight Suns has been canceled on the Switch. It is still planning on coming out on the PS4 and Xbox One May 11th. I thought it was out. It's out on PS5 and Xbox Series. Oh. But the previous gen console uh, is coming out May 11th with all the DLC. Um, but not the Switch version. So if you're looking for a uh, tactical Marvel mysticism game on Switch, eat it. You're not getting it. I think we're going to see a lot of games announced for Switch that are going to get uh, del- uh, d- just removed. <laughs> yeah. They're just going to find that it's not worth it for them to develop I- it. I mean, Hogwarts Legacy is still planned on coming out on the Switch. I am shocked they're still doing that at this point. That's what I wanted. To, I yeah. literally just Googled that because I wanted to see. And that yeah. says it will be released July 25th. I right. do not buy it. We'll see. I think that will not happen. Okay. Uh, next, we got to talk real quick about the Asus ROG Ally. Yes. Uh, the price leaked. Uh, the higher-end Asus ROG Ally will apparently cost just $699.99. That's for the model with the AMD Z1 Extreme chip, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 512 gig SSD, meaning that the Asus uh, 512 gig handheld costs just about $51 more than the equivalent Steam Deck. That's according to data shown to The Verge by reliable gadget leaker Roland Quaint. Is that how you pronounce his name? Quant? Roland. Quand. Quand. I have no idea. Uh, a screenshot, a least screenshot from Best Buy provided by uh, Wicked, uh, Wicked K. Hums. Wicked W. Warwick. Yeah. And an earlier leak by Snoopy Tech. Uh, <laughs> the, the data we've seen leaves little room for confusion. Even the product number associated with the uh, $699 gadget identifies it as the Z1 Extreme model with 512 gig storage. And we've got a long list of marketing claims in our possession that also look legitimate. Uh if yeah. the if the Z1 Extreme starts at 699, what would an ally with a vanilla AMD Z1 cost? Uh Asus confirmed to the Verge this morning that both will go on sale. What is that what does that mean? What? Asus confirmed to the Verge this morning that both will go on sale. The I guess the Z1 Extreme version and the regular Z1 version. That there, okay, so yeah. there, there will be two models. There will be two models. Okay, that they should have said that. Yeah. Uh, f- so yeah, this is as of now, it looks like the high end model with the high end hard drive is only going to sell for fifty dollars more than a Steam Deck. That is that's insane. Insane. Yes, that is insane. Incredibly competitive. It it really does look like that means that the entry level model of this system is going to be as close, uh, as close if not lower than what steam is offering with theirs. So this was confirmed by this random guy on Twitter, but also, uh, best buy. Yeah. So another guy on Twitter, though, showing a best buy screenshot that the more expensive one, the Z one extreme is going to be $700. I heard somewhere else. I haven't seen any confirmation of this. I heard somewhere else that the baseline is going to be $600, which seems like not a lot of a, it doesn't seem like enough of a gap. Yeah. But $600 is still phenomenal <laughs> yeah. for even the baseline of the ROG Ally. Well, the 64 gig Steam Deck starts at 400. Right. So if they want if they really want this to be a Steam Deck competitor, then their entry level model has to come in at around $400. I I think that $600 for a Windows handheld that is more powerful Mm -hmm. than the most expensive steam deck i think is reasonable i think that's i think 600 dollars for that is a reasonable well how much how much storage is going to be on it on the 700 dollars one on the 600 i don't think we have confirmed specs for the 600 dollars right Hopefully around the same. I think that the processor is the biggest difference, but it's still going to yeah. be pretty powerful. Another issue is that uh, things are going to be more better optimized on the Steam Deck. Yeah. So even if it's less powerful, it'll probably run better. But you're still getting shit like a 120 hertz display, Yeah. which is crazy. The hardware in this thing is going to be insane for even $600. So 
if this price point is true, then I think they have a really good chance here. Yeah. Like, like I don't think this is going to uh, outsell the Steam Deck, but I think this is worthy competition for sure. I think that people are really going to have a hard time deciding whether or not they want a Steam Deck or an ROG Ally. Yeah. Uh, H3 Catacomb in the chat says, official announcement is 5, is May 11th. Is that pre-order or purchase date too? Yeah, I, I think, think it's the, the pre-order yeah. date. It is the day that the embargoes lift. Yeah. And they previously announced that they will have a date. Uh, they will have a price on May 11th. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really fishy. And we talked about this before. I think that's really fishy to uh, have a price announcement the day the embargo lifts because then you're like, people can't review the product based on uh the price yeah uh but if it's for 700 dollars, i don't know why they would save the price that long yeah like that's a great price maybe they're nervous maybe they think you know they have they want to try and come in lower than the steam deck but they can't yeah so it's it's I, I, they they claim it's manufacturing issues they want to make sure that they can sell it for as little as possible yeah. and, and that is reasonable but you're kind of late in the game here I hope that the one that I get is the cheap version. I want the baseline model yeah. because I want to see how far you can push the baseline because that is the one that I think that most people are going to be yeah. interested in because they want the cheap one. You try to run things at 120 frames per second and it'll sound like a vacuum cleaner. So here's one thing. The fan is notoriously very quiet. Yeah. I think I was playing Forza at 80 frames per second. Really? Which is fucking yeah. crazy. So, like, don't expect 120 frames on, on things unless it's, right. like, super underpowered. But you could expect, you know, 60, maybe a little more than that. Yeah. Again, people run the Steam Deck 60 hertz, but people run those games at 40. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, that's the ally. Yes. Let's talk about how Nintendo... It's going to be at a convention. Wow. Wow. The publisher, which has over the past decade opted for YouTube broadcasts over a formal uh, participation in video games major industry expos, said Wednesday that it would make an appearance at Gamescom 2023 in Cologne, Germany this summer. The expo runs from August 23rd to August 27th. Nintendo's marketing strategy since 2013 has reshaped how everyone gets... Uh... Oh, there's a typo. Uh... It's not your fault this time. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo's marketing strategy since 2013 has reshaped how everyone now gets uh, their gaming news. Regardless of console, the company hasn't done a live on-stage presentation um, since E3 2012. Since then, the company has instead aired a series of immensely popular Nintendo Direct broadcasts, whether it's had anything to, uh, whenever it's had anything to announce, and other publishers and platform holders have followed suit. Uh, even as Nintendo moved into its pre-recorded broadcast, especially after COVID-19 pandemic shut down so much of gaming's traditional calendar, the company still maintained a booth on the show floor of major expos. Uh, last month, however, E3 uh, was canceled. Good. Uh, Gamescom, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which unlike E3 is open to the general public, is a different show altogether. Nintendo's exhibit at Cologne will follow the July 21st launch of Pikmin 3, so it's possible the company may have something to show then, that it hasn't announced so far. Gamescom is a gaming trade fair and expo hosted in Germany since 2009. Last year, Gamescom's opening night live live stream hosted by Jeff Keighley um, revealed launch, launch dates, updates, and other announcements for more than 30 games, including Dead Island 2, Hogwarts Legacy, Gotham Knights, and Sonic Frontiers. I think it's possible that Nintendo... I mean, Nintendo was also confirmed for PAX, and they yeah. showed up with nothing. <laughs> so it's possible that they go to Gamescom with nothing. Well, if they're making a big announcement like this, that they're showing up, then they have to have something. I don't think so. I think that they make a big announcement like this because Gamescom wants people to come to Gamescom. It the the tweet from Gamescom says Nintendo will be exhibiting at Gamescom 2023. Yeah, they exhibited at PAX and they had a versus booth where you can compete in games. Okay. Like they didn't have anything to show. But <sighs> the thing is, like Gamescom is a much bigger deal than PAX. Yeah. Like Gamescom is huge. If you're going to be at Gamescom, you're you're bringing stuff to show. Not necessarily. I like like I think I understand that it's huge, but I think that Nintendo recently has just been fucking phoning it in at some of these conventions. I mean, true. 
I think that is possible. You think they're, that just gonna, they're just going to show off more Pikmin? Yeah, I mean, they're going to have Pikmin out. I think you'll just be able to play Pikmin. And, like, okay. you know, I, I don't think they're going to have anything crazy. Although, this will be following E3 announcements. Yeah. Or, or like, the E3 time. Mm-hmm. So it's possible they... I, I just think they'll have stuff that they already... I don't think they're going to do any announcements here. I think they're going to have, like, a, like, a Nintendo Direct. Yeah. Like they normally do. And then maybe they'll have some stuff that was in the Direct that will be at the show. You know? Yeah. But it's also possible... They just have a versus booth, right? With nothing else, and they'll and they'll bring friggin' Link, <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom Link statue, and that's it. I'm just gonna shuffle something around real quick. Okay. Uh, Ivysaurus says, "Can I say hi to Will?" No. Too bad. <laughs> Shut down. They don't need to show anything when they can have directs two to three times a year without any conventions. Yeah, but wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. Okay. Um, we we want to talk about Jedi Survivor. I guess it's real quick. Okay. Uh, Digital Foundry's analysis of Jedi Survivor is here, and man, it's one of the most brutal reviews in recent memory. While Respawn has acknowledged the game is running poorly on PC, citing things like powerful GPUs mismatched with lower spec CPUs, that seems to be masking much much larger problems. The gist of the Digital Foundry video is that there is essentially no way to fully fix Jedi Survivor on PC right now. Look at his butt. <laughs> Look at that dumper he's got. Uh, not with any specific settings, nor with any uh, specific machine. Uh, you can be running the game on low settings with the best graphics card on the market, and you will still be running into hitching and frame drops uh, periodically in addition to things like texture. Uh, one issue is that, for whatever reason, Jedi Survivor is barely using the GPU power of most machines, resulting in lower performance. What? And there seems to be baked-in issues that span all settings and systems that are essentially impossible to fix at the player end. Digital Foundry's c- uh, conclusion is a rare one. The call is uh, the they call this the worst PC port of 2023 so far. Uh, where we just had an awful PC port of The Last of Us Remaster and several others before that. Uh, They actually say that the current PC version of Jedi Survivor should not be sold in its current state, which is something I cannot remember Digital Foundry saying before. Not even in the Cyberpunk launch era, where that game actually ran better on PC than consoles at launch. Uh, But while Digital Foundry is focused on the PC, that the game uh, and the game is better on consoles... It's still often not great there either with players complaining about performance issues on PlayStation and Xbox as well. Uh, We have already had one major launch patch for the Jedi Survivor, but as Respawn had said on its message, uh, the PC problems uh, especially are complicated and will take time to test. The general consensus appears to be wait for the PC version to be patched and a few more times uh, to fix many of the issues as you'll have a rough playthrough otherwise. Or you may just want to play it on console, the platform the game was clearly designed for, which you can tell immediately by the awkward menu navigation with mouse and keyboard. Yeah, this isn't a game to play with mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Like, you're, you're swinging around a lightsaber. Yeah, th- that those are designed for, like, you know, control controllers anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so Jedi Survivor um, launched in a, in a very bad way. I believe that uh, that day one patch on Steam was 128 gigs. Yeah, it's a huge game. Like, yeah. like they did not optimize this well. At no, all. no, it, uh, and it sucks because you know this took a, clearly it took a long time to develop, but at the same time, it's kind of like it must have gotten farted out at the finish line to make deadline. I hear it's great. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, a- and also uh, there is uh, there's a I think that they delayed the performance mode yeah or 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 something like that yeah right now it can only really run on consoles at 30 frames a second yeah and so uh people are really upset about that i'm not playing a game like jedi survivor for like you know like i mean like you want it to be like graphically impressive and stuff but like i'm cool with a low frame rate as low as it's as long as it's consistent in a game like jedi survivor if i'm playing a competitive multiplayer game i want as many frames as possible given into my eyeballs but a game like this is like a cinematic experience, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, like, it does cool have like frame rate. it does have more like uh, souls like combat where like you have to be more accurate yeah. with what you do. So like I can understand why a higher frame rate might help you, but at the same time, yeah, like 
as long as it's consistent at 30, yeah. then it, sh- it should work just fine. I look at games like Fallen Order as uh, the gameplay is a vessel for you to get the story. Yeah. Like, uh, it's it's generic hack and slash souls like 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 I, like it's awesome because it's Star Wars yeah. right but I'm not blown away by any gameplay innovation here you know yeah. I'm just playing the game to progress the story right but and it, I'm trying I'm trying to get through the first one yeah. on my Steam Deck and it's great on Steam Deck yeah. um but I'm disappointed because I wanted to play it so I could play this one yeah because I'm interested. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good, you know, Fallen Order was a great game with a really great premise and a good story. And, you know, we were excited that they were going to continue that with another one. But now it's got all these performance issues. Yeah. And it's now circling back to, you know, something I, I've brought up on this podcast before and other people have said it doesn't pay to get games at launch anymore. You know, one thing, the price and also too, the riddle with bugs. Yeah. And you just got to wait. You know, for the bugs to be patched out and fixed as best as they can, and then you get it. But by then, you miss like the the hype window and all that nonsense. There's something really strange going on with um, higher end PC these days. I yeah. think that digital. I think that there was reports that higher end PCs had the issues with Jedi Fall. That's Order. what they were saying. Like a lot of the issues were there. I think that the really high end graphics cards. There's some weird bullshit going on. I w- I was watching something. Of- about like it's it's possible that one of the big problems is the VRAM on the graphics cards is not high enough. Did that break you? Yeah, that broke me. The virtual memory that's on the graphics cards. The new the higher end ones? Yeah. It's not high enough. So they have, so the next generation of graphics cards are hopefully gonna be coming out with like higher or faster VRAM. So the regular memory size is tw- is like on the forty ninety is twenty four gigabytes. Right. So, but I think what's it's the like virtual memory size. I think then? it's like you know a DDR five speed, and you need like DDR seven. That's so ridiculous. Yeah, I, it pisses me off already that the forty nine like like the, the forty series is even a thing because the the increase is so marginal over the last yeah. the last generation. It's like I think they said the forty ninety versus the thirty ninety is like a twelve percent increase in performance, yeah. and people just took their thirty nineties and threw them in the trash and put forty nineties yeah. in there. And they're like, oh my god, look at all the frames. <laughs> Meanwhile, games bug out. Yeah, freaking we play Valorant like all the time. Yeah. Wood has a 4090 in his computer. He has to I think he fixed it. But for the past 2 weeks, he's had to join a game and then leave in the middle of the game because the frame rate was too low. Right. He would have to join the game, leave it, and then come back and then the frame rate would would fi- would fix itself. So in Va- in in Valorant you it's best of 13 right. games. He would leave for four games. <laughs> Every every time we would play, right? Because something's some weird bullshit, yeah. you know. <sighs> VRAM is video RAM. Okay, so it's not virtual. Okay, but still, like, it's it's an insufficient amount of RAM that they're. That's crazy because twenty four gigabytes is an insane amount. Yeah, you know, the the thing is that they they basically shuffled around the names of their cards you know like yeah. they, like they had the 4090 the 4080 and the 4070 uh and they just kind kind of made the 4070 like what the old 3080 was like they yeah, like they no, just kind of shuffled they things did that. so i'm playing on a 3060 ti which right. is a, a low end from the last generation never had a problem i've right. never been like man i wish i could run this better i'm playing games in 4k at 144 hertz which is what my monitor is yeah. and i'm fine yeah i'm playing games on a console <laughs> i was i was seeing a lot of like game reviewers on twitter bringing up like professional game reviewers who work for like you know the you know the major outlets and stuff should they be required to talk about bugs in their review especially if they're ha- they think the game is good they, they should be required to talk about everything they experience yeah 
and I'm seeing a lot of a lot of game reviewers saying like like is that important? Do we need to like there's no integrity in this industry. Yeah, it's it's very they're, they're, it's very strange that they would want to like downplay. Like I understand like if you run into a bug and it's minor or like if you if like you didn't encounter anything like during your playthrough. Yeah. But like certain games are like if the experience is that bad, it should like it should be reflected in the written review. A lot of people were saying because, you know, when it when it gets patched out, it's not going to matter. Yeah. But by the same token, people are reading your reviews at the time of the game's launch. Yeah, yeah, that, that, because it's, I understand the perspective that they're coming from because yeah. they are playing it before the game's out. So yeah. any bugs could be fixed. Also, a, there are reviewers, I think a lot of them, that are afraid of being the ones that say the negative things. Oh, definitely. And that's definitely. really fucked up yeah. to, to, for your job to be a reviewer and you're afraid to be the guy that goes, hey, this doesn't run good. Yeah. And we saw a lot of that with Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Yeah. Um, people got the game weeks early and didn't report on any of the bugs. And that game was riddled with bugs yeah. because they expected a day one patch or something or it could be patched out and maybe the people won't experience it that way. But if I was reviewing that game... Three weeks before the game come out, I would say, yo, man, I can't fucking move in this game. Yeah. They better be a patch, you know, the yeah. day it comes out. I don't, I would even maybe make an addendum to my review the day that the game comes out and be or the, the day that the embargo lifts or yeah. whatever. And, and and if there's no change, I'll say, hey, there's no change. I don't know. I guess I guess the, the game sucks. I don't yeah. know. Like, you have to say that you you, you can't just hope that the zeitgeist is gonna say that everything's fine yeah i think i think part of the problem too is like a lot of game reviewers now want to you know they want to review the game as a piece of art not a product mm -hmm. so like a movie reviewer they don't get into unless it's like egregiously bad they don't get into like the minutia of like you know the acting or the special effects or things like that you know they review the movie as a whole and what their experience was while watching the movie. And I think a lot of game reviewers want to apply the same logic to video games. Yeah. You know, not really worry so much about the technical aspects of it, just what they, what their experience was playing the game. But at the same time, if the game breaks yeah. consistently, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And like people need to know about that. Like you're not get, um like if you're watching a movie and the projection breaks, that's not the movie's fault. But at the same token, that's probably something you're gonna write about in your review. Yeah. You know, if you're playing a game and you consistently fall through the floor at the same point, people are gonna want to know about that. I I think that part of the issue is that uh, if they're playing the game on PC, they could blame their own PCs. Yeah. But if you're playing on console it should be the same experience for everybody. Yeah. So uh, one of the issues with Cyberpunk was that people were playing it on PC and they were they thought, I don't know, maybe it's my graphics card, you know? Yeah. But like, really, it's the, the game game's was bad. fault. Yeah. So that's a gray area I can yeah. understand. Um, people want to see your hoodie. Oh, it's uh, this. Co cookies and Cream, New York. No, Cookies and Crime. Oh. It's, uh, it's an inside joke. If you know, then you know. If you don't, too bad. Okay, all right. Um, what did I want to bring up? More about how reviewers are are yeah. doing some dumb bullshit. It's I I did see somewhere that like you know people are still like people by meaning like consumers and like readers and stuff are still under the mindset that like games need a review score. And when most of the major gaming outlets, I think only like IGN and GameSpot and like a few others, actually give their games like a, a number score at the end. A lot of outlets are moving away from that and just doing like essays because, and honestly, like I, I don't disagree with that mindset because to boil things down to a number is ultimately really reductive. Yeah. You get a bet, much better experience with a full written review or a full essay, a full video essay than you do with just a number because, you know, a, you know, a Sonic seven is different from a Mario seven, you know? 
So somebody in the chat said that um, uh, reviewers are afraid of uh, um, not because they get the game early from the from the company and they're afraid of losing that relationship with yeah. the company. I don't think that's true. I think it's more some reviewers have an actual personal relationship with developers. I think that's yeah. and that is a little awkward to have this relationship and then publish a professional article saying this thing that this guy just spent three years on is yeah. shitty. But that's just the nature of the business. You have to do that. Yeah. I mean, like, the game ha does have to be, like, egregiously bad for them to, like, give it something lower than a, a six yeah. on anything. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh, by the same token, nowadays, I think, like, what, 10,000 games were released on Steam last year? Jesus Christ. So they can't, they literally cannot review everything. So they're only reviewing like the top, like the top of the line stuff, like the most popular things, and generally the most popular things are like, you know, the Pretty good, good. Games, yeah. yeah, that rise to the top. So they're gonna get like decent reviews, yeah, you know, unless something's like like a flop, you yeah, know? or something like actually broken, yeah. I think it's crazy that, uh, like, some people try to guess what everybody's going to think of the game, yeah, you know, instead of just giving their own personal take i mean yeah. I, I, but th but then there's like the whole issue with websites like ign is that it's a conglomerate and and that they their review seems like an official seal yeah. but really it's just a guy that is reviewing it and yeah. he's putting his experience out there on paper and putting a number on it mm -hmm. some people think ign reviews should be something like a committee yeah and i don't think that's i don't think that's it should be that either i don't think that's wrong i think that that could be i, I think that could work um but I think, like, if I'm reviewing a game, yeah, I'm putting all of my experiences down. And if that experience means that the Switch wasn't running good, right. that's going into the review. I think it's insane to leave something like that out. Yeah. I had this week's Nintendo podcast. Oh, boy. Is me doing a tier list of Zelda games. Oh. <laughs> me doing the tier list. Yeah. Because I thought it'd be funny if I did that. Right. And Wood got actually upset because... Some of the games are generally understand understood as some of the greatest games of yeah. all time. But this is my experience right. in my list. Right. Why would I consider your thoughts on the game? Like yeah. that doesn't make any well, sense. Well, that's that's why I don't agree with the whole idea of like committee reviews because, you know, if if you like if you were reviewing Ocarina of Time yeah. and someone else was, you know, you would give it a bad review and someone else would give it a good review. That creates a conflict of interest right there, and it doesn't really, you know, paint the picture of what the official. You're at an impasse. You can't come. Well, no, I think that's constructive. I think that's that's it's good. It's constructive to a point, but like it doesn't really like create like the one statement that the publisher wants to release on the game. You know, but too bad. Like like <laughs> like you. That's why Metacritic's so important because you cr that creates a conglomerate of reviews. Yeah, but like, by the same token, like people misread what Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes actually are. They think Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes are giving these games and movies the grade. They don't understand that it's just really to get a general sense of what yeah. people are thinking about the game. Yeah. So I think I think people need to like readjust what their understanding of Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes are before we can have the discussion of like you know, the importance of it. I think that maybe having Metacritic is the conglomerate that some people want. Like, right. like th that's the committee. Yeah. Thing. But then you're just hoping that all of the individual reviewers are using their own experiences and not trying to guess what, how other people are going to enjoy yeah. it, you know? And I mean, I guess reviewers job is to, I mean, whenever I review a piece of tech, it's always, who is this for? Right. But I'm viewing it from my lens. I'm trying to put myself in other people's shoes sometimes, but at the end of the day, I'm going to review it based on what how I thought of it. Yeah. Anyway. Hello. King Wizard said, I'm on Wood's side with this one. You're wrong here. They don't even know what the fuck <laughs> we're talking about. The episode's not out yet. Part of having so many reviewers now is finding a reviewer who generally align with your interests. You can trust and share a similar view you would. Yeah. Yeah. But I also sometimes like reviews 
who don't align with my interests. Cause like it makes you rethink and challenges what you think a good game could be. That's, that's why I still like watching Yasi Croshaw's videos because even if it's a game that I like, mm-hmm. there's a good chance he doesn't like it. Yeah. But he will explain why he doesn't like it. And that will make me think mm, maybe he has a point. And like, maybe like it'll make you rethink, you know, a game you like, or like make you consider a game that you might not have considered otherwise. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I yeah. It, it's all constructive. It's good to have those conversations. Yeah. That's why having a score is reductive. Yeah. Or a tier list. Yeah. But there's some, some games that I love that are F tier games. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we got to get going here. Uh, okay. Uh, f- is anything else important? We, I, mean, I want to talk about Gran Turismo real quick. All right, but, let's talk but about the, let's talk can about... we skip everything else? Yeah, we'll just say that a Jap a Japanese store um, has barred adults from buying Pokemon cards because they keep reselling them on the aftermarket sites. I just think that's funny that yeah. adults are no longer allowed to buy Pokemon cards in Japan. Um, Mortal Kombat 12 got teased in a 30th anniversary trailer. That was already teased. It it wasn't much of a new tease. It was just like literally a grain of sand that exploded. Okay. Big woo. Uh, the story of Mortal Kombat 11 wasn't great anyway. Uh, the Gran Turismo movie trailer. Yeah, I woke up to this and it looks uh, bad. <laughs> it doesn't look like all that good. It's, I, I mean, I mean, it looks like it could be a lot worse. It, it does. It, it, does. I, it, it doesn't look like horrible, but it looks like just a mediocre. Look, I, like... I think so. The, the The story of the Gran Turismo movie is actually based on a true story. It's based oh. on the story of. Uh, here we go. Uh, Some years ago, Nissan and Sony partnered uh, on the GT Academy, which allowed champion Gran Turismo players the opportunity to train as a race car driver. One of them, Jan Martinborough, actually became a professional race car driver following his training at the GT Academy. And this is his story. So it's, it's based on that true story of a kid who was so good at Gran Turismo. He became a professional race car driver. That is awesome. I didn't know that. I yeah. thought I legitimately thought that they were. This was just their vessel to make uh, people want to play Gran Turismo. Like, no. look, if you play Gran Turismo, you could be a real race car. Well, driver. I mean, look, the trailer doesn't do it any favors because, like, the the opening of the trailer is just littered with like glory shots of PlayStation products. Yeah, and it it makes you think that this is just one big marketing, yeah. which it kind of it, is. It, it is. It yeah. is. I you know, it doesn't help that like. Throughout the whole trailer, it's like David Harbour just keeps recycling like the same cliche, like, oh, this isn't the video game. This is real life. You know, you can't reset. You know, oh, what? You you can't run because you sit on your couch too much? Mi- yeah, too it's like it's very like, cliche. Yeah, like we get it. Like we're, we're kind of past that. You know, you don't have to keep recycling these tropes and jokes or at the very least putting them in the trailer and stuff. So I don't know. I feel like. If you're going to, like, Gran Turismo is the type of game that it just has a generic, it's a racing game. There's, like, really nothing you could do with it. So, I feel like this is the best possible story they could tell with Gran Turismo. It does make me wonder, like, with this premise of somebody who's so good at Gran Turismo, they become a professional race car driver. Could we apply that to other games? Like, we apply you're such it- a good plumber, yeah, you can be Mario. You're such a good Call of Duty player. We're going to send you to actual war. Yeah. <laughs> Did you did? Was that in Pacific Rim or something? I vaguely remember this as like a either a mech thing. No, so actually the the Ender's Game mm-hmm. was basically like they were training these kids and like they make they think it's esports, but it winds up being like actual war. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that's everything. Yeah. Now it's this time. <laughs> This is by a Twitter account. God. This is by a Twitter account called YouTube Thumbnails. Oh, I love God. this Twitter account because it's always <laughs> it's always ridiculous thumbnails. But I can see this being an actual thumbnail for a YouTube video. Yeah. So so you have to look at this thinking this is a whole video somebody made. This is representative of a whole video that somebody made. Okay. Yeah. Here it is. <laughs> now it's <laughs> explain it well explain what this is it is speaking of the phantom menace it is uh the characters of wado and um 
uh, what the hell is his name? The the trade the trade federation leader. Yeah. Um, and yeah. under it just says racist, racist? <laughs> because because Watto does play on Jewish stereotypes, and the the trade federation leader does play on uh, Asian uh, East Asian stereotypes. I didn't put together Watto at all, but I know that the trade federation guy is very clearly an Asian stereotype. Yeah. Yeah. To the point where I think they changed his accent completely in episode two, didn't they? No, it's still like that. It's like way downplayed. Yeah. And he's like barely in it because yes. they knew that he was yeah. a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so remember, there's a whole YouTube video yeah. there about, <laughs> about this topic. Uh, anyway, uh, there was another good one from that uh from that account too oh yeah this oh uh, uh, this is a i did a thing yeah it's, it's jazz not jazz <laughs> and the jazz is him playing saxophone the not jazz is him getting swarmed by bees for some yeah. reason i don't know anyway now we're gonna talk to you real quick yes uh we will start with people who have comments on last week's wolf den podcast over on the youtube channel youtube.com a slash wolf den podcast ad malish militia says uh i love how will just told us that he hadn't pooped in a couple days i feel like we're a part of the family <laughs> it's it's important for people to know so yes things. i don't remember if i pooped today or not so that's an interesting we could be thing in for to a forget sequel. about yeah uh ty zilla says it's hilarious how salty will is about playstation and did he seriously just compare a support studio to Activision? As if Sony acquiring Firewalk, which nobody has heard of, uh, is somehow the same as Microsoft trying to acquire Activision. I don't remember you saying anything like I don't, this at all. I, re I remember making a joke about it, but... He acts like he forgot how... Micro He's probably spending more time talking about this than you did. Yeah. He acts like he forgot how Microsoft bought Rareware... And then Rareware never made another good game because Microsoft ruined them. Rareware made almost all of the best games in the 90s. Stop being such an ignorant and naive Xbox fanboy and be <laughs> realistic. Will's blind allegiance to Microsoft is ridiculous. Don't tell this guy, but I've been playing a lot of my games on PlayStation recently. <laughs> I don't quite understand. I We were pretty... We pretty much understood that. Yeah. We got to the point where we figured out that Firewalk was just a new studio. Yeah. And like, obviously, Sony buying Firewalk is not the same as them buying Activision. We, we were clear on that. There was a, it was a, see, there's this thing called humor. <laughs> there's a joke. There's a joke, son. And uh, I don't remember. I don't. I, maybe it was sarcasm. I don't yeah. remember that, that this at all. Also, don't talk to me about rare games and like what happened after they got bought by Microsoft. We were there yeah. during the N sixty four heyday. We played all those games. We saw what they did to Joanna Dark. We are very much aware of what happened. Don't come for us. I played Banjo Kazooie on Nintendo Switch Online when it came out. Yeah, game is horrible. <laughs> game is wow. not good a lot of people say banjo 2 is the good one right banjo kazooie the first one i mean it was probably passable back then right but man it ain't good yeah i've heard people say that that's the better mario 64 and i've never oh believed god those no i've god, never no. believed those people anyway sifter says super happy that i've been able to catch the podcast every week via the vod here on youtube helps the midnight shift not seem so boring thank you for watching uh banana bear game says this will probably be talked in the next episode but what are your thoughts on the uk block of the activision blizzard merge with microsoft that made all the sony fans rejoice and hope for the fall of my of xbox just now we're complaining about needing competition yeah we talked about this but yeah. uh i always think it's strange when uh like fans of one company are hoping for the downfall of the other company yeah i mean the only other place i like you really see this is like marvel versus dc in like the comic book realm i advocate for the fall of some companies but because yeah. i hate the company right. not so much like that i'm i love one company so much i want the other one to fail right it's more so like i've been burned by a company so many times where i'm like fuck that company right they like need if to you if you like don't like a company like genuinely mm -hmm. Like, 
un, it's understandable. If you don't like a company because you don't own that company's product, yeah, and you bought the competitors, that's yeah, like ridiculous. That, that's a dumb. That's a dumb. That's reason. a very ridiculous. Way so to I can't think of a company where I like have a vendetta against them. The ESA, that's still a little different, right? Um, but a company, I don't. I mean, I had a problem with Retroid because they just kept released. They released a shitty product on purpose. Yeah. Um, that's kind of fucked up. But yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily want them to fail. I just want them to do better. Yeah. You know. M. Arba Binaman says, "Guys, I'm having a huge DS versus PSP deja vu here. Steam Deck as the lower power DS versus the ROG Ally as the high spec PSP. I don't know if that's a one to one equivalent." I think it's pretty similar in that uh, the more powerful one is going to be a worse user experience. Yeah. A worse user experience and probably not as uh, popular. Or popular. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. yeah, more people. Because, like, Steam's already been out on the market. Uh, more, like, more gamers know that name. And games are going to be developed specifically for Steam. Yeah. Their entire yeah. library is already there. Yeah. So. To be fair, that same library will be on the ROG Ally. Right. It's just not going to be as optimized. Mm -hmm. LJWVU said, and now we're in the chat. Yes. He says, the best thing for Sony is a strong Microsoft and a strong Nintendo. Same holds true for Microsoft and Nintendo. Competition makes everyone better. It's true. Yeah, I no, agree. it's true. But at the same time, like, these companies will secretly wish for the downfall of their competitors. Like, I like this new, weird, wacky world we're living in where they're kind of working together a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, that's good, too. But at the same time, you know, like, in, like, in the back rooms of Sony, like, they're just like, well, we fucking get rid of this Microsoft <laughs> nonsense. Get them out of our video games. Edward Bova says, so, Bob, have you seen the Austin Evans YouTube video titled, I Got the Switch to Dev Kit? The moment I saw it, I thought of you and how I desperately need you to break down this video in my life. I need to see it because that would be crazy. Yeah, I didn't know he posted that. Also, we'll make sure to let you know, let everyone know that this Saturday, May sixth, is free comic book day. So yeah, first Saturday in every May, first Saturday in May for every year is free comic book day. Go to your local comic book shop, check out the free comics, and buy shit. If it is a holiday to support local comic book stores, which means you have to buy shit, buy things. Check out the trade paperback section. Check out the back issues. Check out the collectibles. Most of these places sell Magic the Gathering and Pokemon cards. So go to your local comic book shop, pick out some free comics, and buy shit. Also bring kids, because get kids in the comics. Yeah, they have, like, kids comics and stuff yeah. that are free. Um. Anyway, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, the dev kit. The Switch 2 dev kit, Uh, that's interesting. I, I heard rumors of, uh, not, it was like, through third party accounts, I've heard developers talk about like the Switch Pro dev kit right. that happened. Or 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 it it might have now turned into a Switch 2 dev kit. So it's a thing that might actually be out somewhere. Yeah. But um you know, like we know that Nintendo's working on a new console. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is I mean, it's cool just to get a little bit of insight of what's going on, but uh, you know. This isn't going to be exactly what the new console is going to be. It's going to be representative of the hardware a little bit. Usually dev kits are a little more powerful. They have more yeah. RAM. At least the Switch one did. Um, I'm sure the actual form factor is going to be different and shit. So uh, I'm interested though. I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. I have uh, a vendetta with my local shop because they stopped pulling my books for me, says the Konami man. I think getting comics pulled is a little weird because then you have to like have some awkward conversations sometimes like you have to yeah. be like no i don't want this comic anymore or you don't go to the comic shop anymore yeah. and like that that's a that's a big problem you haven't been there for like two weeks and they pull the comics for you and you don't want to buy the one yeah. you know like that, i mean that's one where like you need to like actually know like what you're going to reconsistently have a good relationship with the store but by the same token like that's actually helps out a lot of stores if you give them your pull list because this way they know exactly what to order yeah because a lot of times like stores are just ordering blindly based on what they think is going to sell yeah and if they order too much then they're potentially stuck with an entire backlog of comics they're not going to sell if they order too little then they might not get anything until a second printing yeah so 
uh, we had a uh, Gotch 50 with... Uh, oh, I, I missed yeah, this. It's from 28 minutes ago. Oh, God. Uh, Wolf Bros, are you guys excited for the Flash movie? No, I haven't seen a DC movie in a hot minute. I mean, you're not really missing much so far. Uh, I'm, I might go see it in theaters. Depends on like what my mood is that weekend, but we'll see. It doesn't look terrible. It actually looks like it's going to be good. So, I, I mean, I, I want to see, uh, what's his name? Batman. Ben Affleck. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instant hologram says, Bob, it was cool to see you figure out Tinkercad for your video. Do you know about SVG files? I only know about SVG files in the, in 2d vectors like you could use that for like illustrator and stuff yeah and like logos i've never used it for 3d stuff um danker says your opinion on woods long con on fooling the internet with the fake zelda switch i thought that was funny finish the video because he, he didn't actually like <laughs> like that i watched wood told me you need to watch my next video you're gonna be very proud of me because he did a he did a fucking uh slider shot right and it was a pretty good shot <laughs> but i watched the video because he told me to and I was enraged because <laughs> I thought he fooled me. And I was like, he's, he's, he's lying to his audience. This yeah. is fucked up. Is everybody, no one's ever going to believe him again. And then three quarters of the way through the video, he goes, just kidding. It was real the whole time. <laughs> <sighs> Fucking guy. So yeah, finish the video. That's the problem is that 40% of people aren't going to make it yeah. that far. You know, like people are going to think that he actually lied to people. Yeah. You can take a single color design, convert it to SVG, and import it into Tinkercad. Here's your logo, for example. Oh, oh. that's cool. Let's see what this. Oh, that's there cool. You go. Start 3D printing that on everything. That's really cool. I I didn't know you could do that. I I do have uh a lot of SVG files. Uh, all right. Anything else? Speak now, because we're gonna go. It's likely to cover his ass from Nintendo. It's not. He literally, Wood literally says in the video, just kidding, it's real. <laughs> Watch the video. He shows both the real one and the fake one. He legitimately got it early. Right. Unless he's lying to me, in which case I will be very upset. <laughs> Him saying satisfy made the box room is what gave it away for me. <laughs> yeah, satisfy <laughs> would not do that. Uh... All right, that's it. We're done. Thanks All for right. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den Podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolf If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolf Den Podcast. So go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want. If you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well. We're also an audio podcast on Apple Podcasts. Google Play, Spotify, your preferred podcast service of choice. But no matter where you get the show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all those respective platforms. Thanks for being here, guys. Um, I'll most likely be live on Thursday, but who knows? I might do a wacky thing. Um, anything else? Video Thursday also, all that good stuff. Uh, what out? What the? What out? Everything's the same. I do the same <laughs> shit every week. Um, who's live? Anybody I know? No. Here's AJ again. Everybody say hi to AJ again. See you Thursday. Bye. Bye.